This is the Asus EPC, the first netbook. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right. Let me let me try that one more time. The first netbook. I can't, I can't call this the first netbook because it's really not. But then again, it kind of is. So sit back and listen to my story. The term netbook had been around long before the EPC was released in late 2007. In fact. There was a lesser known time when netbook-like machines roamed the earth back around our entry into the 21st century. From the early 90s to around 2003-2004, there were plenty of small form factor computers to go around. HP was cranking out Jornadas, Nokia had their 9000 series of communicators, Sony had their whole radically designed line of handhelds, and how could we forget Shin's contributions to all of this, which was literally branded as the Shin Netbook? Oh yeah, there were plenty of lawsuits to go along with that. And there were so many other manufacturers jumping on the Palm Top and PDA bandwagon. 2004 through 2007 were the Netbook doldrums. And then there was a small but important breeze that set the Netbook revival into motion. Do you remember... Nicholas Negroponte from our last video. You know, a hundred dollar laptop, hand crank, free and open source philosophy, that guy? Well, his brainchild, the OLPC, sent out a call to the mass consumer market for portable, affordable computing. And this was the response. Now, with the palm tops and PDAs of old, we had portable but we lacked affordable. And now we are back to the EPC. Rumors had it that this would be a 199 machine at launch, coinciding with the OLPC XO-1, which was available for about 200 bucks per pop through the Give One Get One initiative. That rumor failed to evolve into the truth, and at release, models ranged from 299 US dollars to 399 USD. There were several different configurations available. The lowest in configuration was the EPC 700 series 2G Surf, which is what I was able to get my hands on. The 2G represents the amount of flash storage, which is 2GB in this case, and the Surf is the model without the webcam. At least as far as I can tell, that's the only difference between the 2G and the 2G Surf. There were also 4G and 8G variants. All models used the same 900MHz Intel Celeron M, 800x480 7-inch WVGA screen, Intel GMA graphics, and DDR2 RAM, though the HG could be configured with up to 1GB of RAM out of the factory, while the other models shipped with 512MB of RAM. These could be upgraded with 2GB of DDR2, though oddly enough, this example is lacking the RAM access door. During my research, all the models I saw had the RAM access door, and from what I can deduce, this one lacks said door, either because it's a later model 700 series, or because it's the Surf version. While trying to get to the bottom of this, I unearthed a little controversy. At first, Asus would void the EPC's warranty if the RAM door was opened, which isn't that surprising to be honest, but this caused a bit of an uproar among owners, and Asus got rid of that policy. But here's a conspiracy theory for you. What if they got rid of the RAM door altogether, so they didn't have to worry about owners cooking their machines during a RAM upgrade gone wrong, and then RMAing it? Once again, just a theory. But I found it really weird that they would go through the effort to have a different design for no reason. It could also be that a single piece bottom was just cheaper to manufacture, um, since you know they didn't have to have a cutout for the access door and it could just be one piece. But anyway, back to our dinky little 701 here. When I first unboxed this, I poked fun at it for feeling so cheap, and material wise there is nothing premium about it. The entire body is this white plastic, however the netbook is much more rigid than you would think an entirely plastic laptop would be. I would not hesitate to toss this into a backpack, especially since it's only 2 pounds and is absolutely tiny, coming in at approximately 9 inches long, 6 inches wide, and 1.5 and inches thick at the battery underside, which is its thickest point. For such a small machine, you get a pretty good selection of I.O. On the left side, you get 3.5mm audio in and out jacks, a single USB 2.0 port, and Ethernet. On the right, there are two USB 2.0 ports, an SD card reader, lock slot, and a VGA port. As a result of the EPC's size, the keyboard and trackpad were miniaturized. A standard letter key on the EPC is approximately 15mm by 13mm, while standard keys on the normal laptop are around 16 by 15mm. Over the few weeks that I have had this machine, 
I have not been able to get used to these miniaturized inputs. These keys are just too close together and too darn small. I still find the keyboard incredibly frustrating to use, and I chucked the trackpad up to a lost cause and plugged in a USB mouse. If the EPC was not so well known, you would never know that there was a 900 megahertz Intel Celeron M under the hood. This lightweight Xandros, at least I believe that's how you pronounce it, that's X-A-N-D-R-O-S, Linux distribution combined with solid state storage makes for a very snappy user experience. There were models that shipped with Windows XP, but this is one of the Linux models. This version of Xandros for the EPC was simplified with a minimal UI which resembled a mobile aesthetic. Tabs organized applications by category, and each application gets its own big square button. Almost every application you would need for a basic office machine was installed out of the box, including a web browser, the open office suite, and even a few games to pass the time. Now, the neat thing about the Linux version of this machine is that underneath the simplified UI, you still have a full-fledged Linux distro. Control-Alt-T will open up the console where you have access to basic programming and command line Linux tools. Browsing the web on this older version of Firefox blew me away. I was genuinely surprised at how well this still handles web browsing. Sure, some sites don't load quite right, but it works well enough where you could still use this to read the news and do a little research today in 2019. Now the EPC gets a lot of flack for being so plasticky and its tiny screen and keyboard and trackpad straight out of purgatory, but for a first attempt at an affordable, small form factor, consumer facing laptop, it's definitely respectable. This pioneer of the netbook revival paved the way for other simple small form factor machines prevalent today such as Chromebooks. Going back to the EPC's questionability of being the first consumer netbook, if you define a netbook as a slightly larger palm top like machine capable of running office applications and with a rock bottom price tag, then sure, the EPC is the first general consumer netbook. But I disagree with this. The term netbook had existed long before the 2007 revival. And while the EPC brought with it many improvements over its predecessors, the major difference between it and them was the affordability factor. So while I believe the EPC was the first affordable consumer netbook, and it did play a huge role in defining the meaning of the term netbook as we view it today, I will always be hesitant to call it the first netbook ever. If any of you guys want to try out an EPC for yourself, I snagged this one from Lake Michigan Computers for $21.50 plus shipping. So I will put the link to their store down in the description. So maybe uh, you guys can pick one up for about the same price. Thanks for watching guys. That is going to be about it for this video. I will see you guys in the next installment of A Computers and Technology.